Good afternoon. It is 4.08, Wednesday, September 25th. This is the TDN Writer's Room Podcast. I'm Joe Bianca, Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. This is Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News, and I also co-host a horse racing radio show with a legendary Dave Johnson on Sirius XM Radio called Down the Stretch. I'm Jonathan Green, General Manager of DJ Stable and also part of the Green Group, uh, tax and and accounting specialist in the thoroughbred industry. I was fortunate enough to spend about a week down at Keeneland uh, looking at the horses down there and just flew home and boy, are my arms tired. (laughs) This is Alan Carrasso, Managing Editor of the TDN, and I don't have to watch baseball this week as a fan of the Chicago Cubs who've just absolutely tanked. It's, It's been disastrous. Uh, don't get me started yeah, on no, the Red no. Sox now, Alan. We don't want to do that. I can't believe we haven't done any baseball. This could devolve yes. very quickly <laughs> yeah. if we start doing baseball <laughs> right. talk. Okay. Let's go. Um, all right. So we're going to start this week with a little brief recap of last week's racing. I think as we get closer to the Breeders' Cup, we're going to have longer recaps, as, like especially next weekend and the following weekend of the real big uh, prep weekends for the Breeders' Cup. We'll have more forward-looking stuff after that. But we had like the we had the last big. I mean, I guess technically the Malibu, but we had the last big restricted three-year-old race over the weekend, the Pennsylvania Derby. And I thought it was kind of an apt metaphor for this three-year-old division that five of them hit the line about a length and a half apart of each other. And I thought that was kind of uh, symbolic of, of the topsy-turvy nature of this division, which I guess the uh, the division got even topsy-turvier this weekend with Math Wizard pulling off a 30-1 to upset in the Pennsylvania Derby. Just a couple of things I wanted to note about the race. I thought it changed a little bit once Improbable missed the start. I thought he actually ran a pretty remarkable race considering he was bogged down in the inside, which is not where you want to be at parks all through the stretch. For, so for him to be still be pretty close, I think he's a horse that could make some noise next year as a four-year-old. But the other thing that's interesting is Math Wizard was – third in Maximum Security's debut, which, as we all know, was for a $16,000 tag and probably the livest 16,000 maiden claimer you could ever find. But Math Wizard's more, even more interesting to me than Maximum Security because he was in for 16 the next start and was claimed out of that race, and he won by six and three quarters, and then was in for 25K the next start and won by 18 and a half lengths and was again claimed. So we'll, we'll, we'll broaden this out a little bit, but it's just it shows how even on a regular Wednesday at Gulfstream or whatever, you can you can find a pretty good racing prospect, especially early in the three-year-old year. Uh, I'm to open the floor up. What were your impressions of the Pennsylvania Derby, if any? Oh, just that it added to a weird year with a very weird finish. Now, the Malibu is for three-year-olds, but I look at the, the races that really matter as the two-turn dirt races. Um, there's nine grade ones of those. The only horse to have won two, of course, is maximum security. Would be three if he weren't taken down in the Kentucky Derby. But it, you know, it doesn't get any stranger than this. I mean, first of all, every, everybody, instead of sending you guys down to Florida next year to cover the uh, Mucho Macho Man and the Holy Bull. You better go down and cover 16,000 our maiden claimers. Uh, I, I mean, what are, are the odds, what, 500 million to one that two graded stakes winners would come out of that race? Grade one um, two, two grade one winners. So it, 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 it put the period on the end of the sentence. Not only is this group, uh, what did you call it, topsy turvier? I like that I guess word. I got is that a real word? It I don't even know. Topsy turvy, and now it's even topsy turvier. B- but I think it was kind of a fitting end to a division that just was just kind of a mess the whole year long, Uh, of of course, beginning with, well, not beginning with because he had the races before, but highlighted by the disqualification of maximum security in the Kentucky Derby and the lawsuits and all the the nonsense that went on with that. It's a year for three-year-olds that we are going to want to forget. Obviously, it was a... uh... Another strange, another strange result. And like you said, Improbable didn't, doesn't leave the running. Um, it gets a, an inside trip. Probably, you're probably right. You don't want to be on that part of the racetrack. Uh, also, just from a physical standpoint, I mean, he looks like a stretchy enough kind of horse. And, and he just may not, from a physical standpoint, like being down in there either. Um, and, and, you know, and, and Mike Smith rode for luck, tried to get him there up, up the inside. I agree with you, Joe. I think he, under the circumstances, I thought he, uh, I thought he ran uh, a fine race. As for the, um, for the also-rans, you 
couldn't really make any excuses for Mr. Money. Had it his own way up front, and uh, and War of Will, uh, you know, stalked that easy pace, and um, you know he had every chance the last three sixteenths of a mile, and and just couldn't see it out. John. So now we're sitting here, and it looks like that there's you know maybe two more races before the end of the year for most of these horses, and you sit there and say, okay, who would you vote for? Who would be your vote for three? We tried this last week, year. we couldn't figure right. it out. And, and you still can't figure it out. I mean, it, it's just you have to scratch your head. And, um, you know, with regard to just to put a, the icing on the cake about, about the claiming races, I remember very distinctly charismatic winning you know one of the triple crown races and sitting there and saying wow that horse was available for 50 i can't believe that you know i wasn't there the day that the horse was running at santa anita for fifty thousand hours how would you like to be windy lee farm uh enrique arroyo or lucky seven stable that actually owned the horse lost it in a claiming race three consecutive claiming races and i know because we were one of the people that got out shook for him for sixteen thousand. there were six people in you you really really uh, honest truth yeah there were six people in and i said okay well we got a one in six chance which is better than a one in 20,000 chance that you have when the foals are all born and, and they're coming in. But the horse was was not only claimed, uh, you know, three consecutive races, but there were a good 25 people who were in for him yeah. in, in the three different races. So that part was, you know, w- was a surprise. Um, the thing that was that was also a surprise was him coming down the stretch at 30 to 1 mm-hmm. and running the kind of numbers he did. The I know from a, uh, from a Sheets standpoint, Math Wizard, and again, 2020 hindsight, Math Wizard had the numbers that look like that he could compete. Um, so surprising, A, that he came down the, the, the middle of the racetrack the way he did, and B, he came down at 30 to 1 um, the way he did. But it was, uh, it, again, topsy turvy I think we're going to try to name a horse that, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, for, for the next year. All right. Uh, just don't put him in for a tag. <laughs> at, least, um, at least not a golf track. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good point. I, I assume there were a million, sh- it was a million ways shake for, for those horses. But uh, he... I thought he ran really well in the Ohio Derby when he was beaten by Owendale by half length. Thought that he ran a really good, really brave race in there. And Owendale kind of tripped out, but it, I, I, this happens to me in my handicapping all the time. I kind of forget back races if the last couple weren't great, and it was a little hard to take him after he got drubbed by Mister Money twice in a row. But yeah, he certainly stepped up when it mattered the most. Um, though I was just going to man, uh, mention that. I mean, how can you like a horse uh, that just got beat by 11 and three quarter lengths by Mr. Money? I mean, how do you, how do you as a handicapper say, okay, he's going to reverse that 11 and three quarter lengths? I mean, so it makes this game so frustrating. And the reason why the horse was 31 to one, even though, John, you think that was a little bit of an overlay. Um, we don't want to beat this to death, but it, might as well, since we're, we have this weekend coming up, put in a code of honor into the, the, the discussion now. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, it looks like maximum security is going to back into the three-year-old championship. I think there's only one possibility that he doesn't because the Pennsylvania Derby eliminated the chances of, of everybody else in that race, unless some kook is going to be- vote for math wizard. But if code of honor wins the jockey club gold cup, is he the three-year-old champion over maximum security? Now, you know, they would both have to officially have two grade one wins. Uh, but I, I think, you know, there's uh, a lot of just sort of negative feeling around maximum mm-hmm. security. Um, and also it's what have you done for me lately? Right. And that's that to me, that's the problem is that, you know, obviously with his Kentucky Derby win or win, his Kentucky Derby performance and Florida Derby win, his Haskell win, these are things that stick in people's minds, but I think what also sticks in people's minds is he didn't show up for the second half of the year. And I think, and especially now when the three-year-olds like Code of Honor are starting to run against elders, I think that that's going to be a negative that's held against him is that he didn't even, like you say Code of Honor doesn't win the Jockey Club Gold Cup, but runs well, doesn't win the Breeders' Cup Classic, but runs well, runs second or third. For me, I'm not a voter, but for me, I would give more credence to that than something Maximum Security did in March just because the this is kind of when the cream rises to the top, and this is when everybody is pretty much going for the same goal. It's much easier to just pick your spots earlier in the year, and I, it's just a personal thing. We're going to talk, talk about the cotillion for a little bit as well. Uh, John obviously had a, had a principal. Yeah, I would prefer we don't talk about the cotillion. <laughs> Listen, I was right. just, you didn't got to let me finish, <laughs> is that she had no chance with that pace, so I'm not going to... I'm not going to hold that against her or against Jay Walker or anything like that. But that it was really interesting because it was a supersonic pace in the cotillion, which we kind of talked about and kind of predicted last week. And then they were dawdling in the Pennsylvania Derby, which actually to me made Max, Math Wizard's 
it's a hard name to say, Math Wizard's performance better is that he had to close into that slow pace. The Cotillion, we had an extended discussion on Guarana last week and her Hall of Fame credentials. Uh, uh, excuse me, could you please, the year. Uh, Joe, could you please pass me that roll of paper towel so I can wipe <laughs> all that egg off of my face? No, but again, um, let me finish. Okay. I thought she ran great, honestly, because... But she didn't win, yeah, so... Yeah, of course. You know, okay, yeah, so... Uh, plenty of other chances, I, I, but the, I, um, the, the statue that they were going to erect to her that yeah. is on hold for right. now. Okay. Yeah, they haven't broken ground yet. Yes. But, uh, so she took a little stumble out of this out of the gate and she was the only one near that pace that really stuck around and she was clear for a second so I think you got to give her a lot of credit for that and I still believe what I said last week that I think she ultimately is going to be better going a one turn mile or shorter races and I was much more impressed with her performance running second on Saturday than I was in her winning the coaching club American Oaks anybody have any feelings about that well, one thing I'd like to add is um, uh, now you've got Dunbar Road back into the equation, of course, for the three-year-old Philly Championship. But can any of those horses beat Midnight Bisou and a late in the Breeders' Cup distaff? I don't think so. I think the, the older Phillies and Mayors are just in, in another league. Uh, it's taking nothing away from the two Chad Brown horses. I think they're terrific. And I think also what you're looking at for the three-year-old Phillies, similar to the boys, I mean, it's just such a muddied group. You look at all the horses that ran – um, number of grade one winners that ran in the cotillion. And then on top of that, I think that personally the most impressive race of the, of the weekend was Confefi, um, you know, winning the, the, the sprint race. And she's a three-year-old filly as well. So, you know, last year living through the Eclipse Awards and, and being fortunate enough to have one of the three nominees and, and ultimately having the winner, um, you know, that was exciting. I wouldn't want to be one of the decision makers to limit it to three horses at this point. Is it Confefi? Is it Dunbar? Is it, you know, uh, Street Band, Garana? Is, assuming that they, you know, again, that, that, uh, that she runs back and, and wins or, or runs best um, next time out. But, you know, Bill, to your point, they are no match for the older mares right now. Yeah. Um, Midnight Bisou and, and, and Monami Girl are just, you know, off the charts better. Um, you're still looking at three-year-old fillies that, for buyer numbers, haven't broken triple digits yet. The, the winner street band ran a 99 um, buyer number in the, uh, in the cotillion. And I think, on average, the older mares are averaging like 103 to 105. Mm -hmm. Can we just stop and, and give some props to... Alan Carrasso, who picked Street Band on this very I don't know podcast if, I mean, I don't, last I'm week. I'm sitting next to John here. How, how, what's your like? What's your wingspan here, John? <laughs> <laughs> right. you, weren't, you, weren't, you weren't the only one that was that was picking somebody over than us, and, and rightfully so. That's okay. Yeah, I mean, but, the race set up for, for, yeah. for Street Band, and she came through. But, Al, want to go a little bit? Um, <laughs> listen, my handicapping successes are so few and far between. Um, I, I, I mean, it was obviously a... Uh, a nice result. Um, you know, so many times you look at a race and you and you dope it out and you map it out and and then it runs upside down and um, you know occasionally everything comes together and it and it runs exactly like it looks on paper. So, Very and um, frequently, unfortunately, for all of us. Yeah. But uh, listen, she got a good ride um, from Sophie Doyle, who um, you know knows her very well. Uh, you know, gave her a patient ride from from behind, and um, you know, at the five sixteenths, you you felt good as a street band backer. She was traveling; um, she really hadn't been asked yet. You know, it was a question of whether she was going to go inside or out. I thought there was some chance she'd, she'd go for maybe a three path run, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, came wide and and you had the guns to to, to peg back uh, Gorana there in, in the final sixteenth of a mile. So uh, no gloating, but. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, All right. Well, pat myself. I gave you. I gave you the right. opportunity at least. Uh, one horse. One of the horses I wanted to mention before we turn the page from last weekend was King Jack, lightly raced horse, TDN Rising Star. Um, was his graded stakes debut? I believe he ran in the Shared Belief and and was was second to Improbable before that. Ran a one hundred eleven buyer in the Gallant Bob, which you just don't see really much anymore at all from 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 horses but especially from a three-year-old sprinter he might be able to make a late run at the breeders cup sprint here he's got some tough competition but 
Bill, I know you were pretty impressed by him as well. Well, well definitely. And it, it, he had run second to improbable in, in the start before. But um, I, I think there's something about him. And, and I, I don't want to get out of order here because this is sort of relevant to Santa Anita, which we were supposed to talk about uh, coming up a little bit later. But uh, one thing that's gone completely unmentioned is uh, right now, Jerry Hollendorfer has two very good horses for the Breeders' Cup in King Jack and Basilica. And was Santa Anita ready to? open in, 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 you know, what, 48 hours or whatever, um, we haven't heard word one whether or not he's going to be able to race there or not. Mm -hmm. um, and if I assume, I, I, I can't imagine they changed their minds. If he's not allowed to race there, what happens to these horses in the Breeders' Well, Cup? he's got uh, Ben studying in the chandelier on Saturday, and Dan Ward is listed as the trainer. So maybe that's what it'll be. Just, yeah. Okay, Ward will be the trainer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it looks like they're still holding out on that. And now they all go to court and the lawyers get rich. Yeah. And, and let me just add on a, on a personal note, what a great story for Mike Stinson, who uh, recently put in so much money into the business, bought a number of top bred uh, yearlings and two-year-olds over the past couple of years um, through the, uh, you know, the, the selection process of, uh, of McGreevy, um, who did so well with, uh, you know, with all the horses like Jostle and, and um, all the horses for, uh, Fox Hill. Fox Hill. Thank you for Fox Hill. And he hand selected this horse, uh, King Jack. And and I remember talking to McGreevy about it after the after the sale, and said, you know, are you sure? You know, why'd you spend so much money on a on a Jimmy Creed? And he said, this is this is the one that that has that you know look to it. Mm. And I said, can you explain to me what that look? I've been looking at horses for thirty years at the sales. <laughs> could you could you imp, you know import that kind of knowledge on me? And he said, this is a this is a Saturday horse. This yeah. is a Saturday horse. And and sure enough, it took a little while for him to develop, um, but a one eleven is off the charts. Yeah, I, I lied. There's one other horse I wanted to mention because John is here. I wanted to talk about Colby. Winning the two-year-old stake Saturday night at Charlestown. Did you make it to Charlestown? Were I, you able to do the daily double? I, I didn't. As a matter of fact, I, I watched all the races from home, uh, all the ones from Parks and, and Charlestown. And incidentally, we also did have a horse running for uh, Maiden 12-5 at Mammoth that day. So, you know, we don't want to forget that. <laughs> Are there any claims? Uh, uh, no claims on that one either. No, I got to run him at Gulfstream Park for 16 yeah, right. to, to, cool. to lose him. Uh, but, yeah, thank you very much. So hopefully we'll have the uh, the next jaywalk uh, coming down the down the, the uh, pike with, it, uh, with Colby. It was an interesting race, too, because it kind of seemed like she was retreating a little bit on the turn and you would think like with a short stretch like they have at charlestown that's like the end but then she managed to come alive and get up yeah and and not to bore the listeners she the first time she ran um she was coming down the stretch she's a come from behind sprinter right now because they were you know primarily running short races for two-year-old fillies and uh, she's coming down the stretch in in fourth place and took like a weird jump step um and then ended up just kind of running even after that she won her next time out, and uh, again, as you mentioned, Joe, at uh, Charlestown, coming down the stretch, and she took like a weird hop step, um, like around a shadow or something, mm -hmm. because it was night racing. And uh, and then, you know, Ortiz was riding her, went inside and outside, and finally, you know, got her on a good path of the racetrack, mm -hmm. which is a little muddy that day, and she accelerated down the racetrack. So yeah. um, hopefully we'll see bigger and better things for her, uh, you know, two turns especially. I was writing the race recap, and you see the horse, you see the winner before you write it out, and then you watch the replay. And I was watching it near the top of the stretch. I was like, how is this horse winning yeah, you go, this no race? Way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. I mean, exactly. that, that would suggest that she's going to be okay stretching out. But. I would think so. Yeah. I would think so. And that Charlestown racetrack is, is a, a goofy track in the sense that that it's, you know, seven furlongs. I, I say it's like seven turns for seven furlongs. It really, <laughs> it really yeah. is kind of a, a strange racetrack. And you have to know that track. So coming in, you're at a little bit of a disadvantage. Um, and I think that's why the, the filly ran a little skittishly. But, you know, it's only her third start. Mm -hmm. So uh, like anything else, this is only my second podcast. So I'm sure there's room to improve. <laughs> And for her, start slow, finish fast. Exactly, exactly. Um, but thank you for mentioning. Yeah, it. I appreciate of course. It. Yeah. Uh, um, so I thought about you guys when, when I was watching that race. All right, turning the page from last week's races, we're gonna wrap up Keeneland September real quick. Finally uh, finished after its three month run, or at least seemingly so. It's a pretty pretty big marathon. Shout out to everybody at the TDN who was there covering it. Uh, great job, great sales coverage. But I'm glad that we have John here to talk about it because I feel like I'm I'm a, more of a layman when it comes to analyzing sales. I feel like Bill would say the same thing. I don't know about Al. Al's, Al's, a, Al's a jack of many trades. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so I'm glad we have John here. It seemed like it was a slight drop off from last year overall, but still a pretty strong market. And it seems like this is something that they say pretty much after every sale. The Boyd Browning or Bob Elliston will say that it's a polarized market. You know, the top horses are selling really well. 
and there's not that much in the middle. John, you kind of are a middle market shopper, I would say. Um, how do you think? Do you think that that squares with reality that there's there's a consistently polarized market, whether it's Keeneland, whether it's Facebook, whatever? Do you agree with that? And how do you try to navigate that and find those middle market horses? No question about it. Instantly, I've been called a lot worse than a middle market buyer, so that, that's actually okay. Um, I, I, I would agree with the sentiment that there's definitely a, div a division uh, amongst the buyers. And, and Bill, I think you mentioned it, um, if not last podcast, two podcasts ago, about, you know, in, in the United States, the wealth is, is you know, the is going up and up and, and, and leaving kind of the middle class and the and lower class behind. And being concentrated, concentrated in the hands of very few, yes. Exactly, exactly. I couldn't have said it better. Um, and, and you know, I think that's what's happening with, with the yearling sales, um, especially, where it's getting more polarizing. And you see horses that are selling for half a million, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000 that previously you thought would bring 200000 Not that 200000 isn't a lot of money, because it is, but um, it, it almost gets to the point where the super rich are going to a horse sale and they're saying, how much is the horse worth? Okay, that's great. But it's worth more to me for me to win this battle. And the battle being the 62nd, you know, battle in the auction. And I remember standing there actually watching the horse sell for $8.2 million, the filly, and saying to the trainer I was with, there's no way in hell this horse is going to be worth $8 million. There's just, there's just no way out. There's no exit strategy from a financial standpoint. And at that point, it dawned on me that it wasn't that the horse in question is going to be worth, the American Feral Philly is going to be worth $8.2 million or not. It's were the combatants, the two human people who were bidding on the horse, what was their ego worth mm -hmm. to be able to stand there and say... Who was the underbidder, by the way? Um, it was Jake Mel. Jake Mel, yeah. Okay. Jake Mel. Yeah. But, uh, but needless to say, what, whether they get on the cover of, of a publication or not, that's really what it came down to because... Unfortunately, you know, there's no guarantee the horse is going to win a big enough race to be on the cover, but it damn well will when it leads, you know, the, 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 is the top sale horse. Yeah. And the thing I was saying, that we were talking about this a little bit last week that and Bill was saying that this is the, the, the price of a dream. Everybody, everybody's got the lottery ticket or whatever. They have that dream that not, not, is not necessarily a, a sound investment, but it, you have a goal in mind that you're willing to take a chance on. And that's, that's the case with these super rich people. And the thing is, like, like you say, they get the headlines now. Nobody remembers if these horses don't turn out to be any good. You know, there's no, there's no follow-up story two years later to say, hey, this horse sold for $5 million. Why is it such a bad runner? You know, it's kind of, it's kind of forgotten over time and, and they get the they get the press up front and don't really have to deal with the ramifications later no question about it and, and the other thing i noticed just uh, on fly on the wall for the book one and book two um is just looking at the number of million dollar horses and i know in 2018 it was 27 or 28 horses i think that were that were million dollar horses and there were only 22 this year yet the average of the sale went up mm. um so you say okay well why is that well obviously the top end is continuing to drive it but what you're seeing also is that the number of buyers at that end are partnering up. Um, and, and it's almost like, you know, last call at the bar where you <laughs> say, okay, well, who can I partner up with tonight, you know, to, to make it home? Um, and, and you look at some of these partnerships and, you know, China Horse Club has enough money to buy anything they want. But then same thing with Magner and, and Pete Brandt and Rapoli, you know, SF, all, all those guys. They have enough money where they could walk into any sale and buy any horse that they wanted to. But strategically, what they're doing now is they're partnering up with their with their combatants and saying, OK, rather than us knock heads and Alan and I bidding on the same horse and, and making the consigner and the owner of the horse more money, let's pool our resources. And as long as we can work together and, and agree on a trainer, we're going to go ahead and buy the horse and, the, and therefore I'm um, getting rid of other uh, combatants in there. So mm -hmm. the horse may still sell for a lot of money, but now it's easier because it's only 50 cent dollars and they're getting rid of some of their competition. So it's an interesting strategy. Yeah. And so they can't beat them, join them kind of thing. And is there's, you know, most of these, most of these people want to, unless you're buying a Philly, of course, most people want to be in the starting gate for the Kentucky Derby and there's only, only 20 stalls. So, you know, if, you, if you're partnering up with a lot of people, instead of competing with them directly, you give yourself a better percentage chance. Then they should be watching those 16 maiden claimers at Gulfstream. Yeah. That's exactly. what they should be doing. But I, okay. you know, I wanted to bring that up also just because of this, that we talked about it a little bit last week, but racing is kind of a meritocracy in that way and that the horse doesn't know how much they cost. And once they get on the racetrack, they can either run or they can't. I think there was no better example of that than Math Wizard and Mas Maximum Security's maiden claimer and Math Wizard being available three different times for a claiming tag that, 
makes it fun for everybody that it's great to get the splashy headlines with the big auction buys, but, and it doesn't amount to a hill of beans until they actually step on the track and, and try racing out. And that's, that's what keeps everyone coming back at all levels, upper, middle, and the bottom tier. And one more observation just from the Keeneland sale, just to, to bring it up. Um, I went through, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy, so I went through statistics and, and trying to figure out what, you know, if there's any patterns to previous um, um, cycles. And in 2009, the um, RNA percentage at Keeneland was 27%. Okay. Um, this year, for the same period of time, the, the book books three and four, anyone want to wager a guess as to what the RNA percentage was? Mm, it's got to be lower. 22? 22? 19. 19? 20. 20. Okay. It was 26%. Wow. So it was wow. almost exactly the same. Right. And other years, though, you guys would be right. It was under 20% for the other years. Mm -hmm. So what, do you, what does that mean? Does that, is that really anal analogous to anything? Um, what it's showing is that as we're reaching the, you know, climate of, of uh, the climax of, of sales, um, RNA numbers go up because the, you know, people are putting more money into these horses. Therefore, they're expecting to get more money out. If they don't get more money out at the sale, then, you know, then, then they're, they have to be willing to, to run them. And it's just a cycle that you're seeing now where um, RNA numbers are starting to go up because expectations are so high. And, you know, my feeling just from a financial standpoint is that things are going to start to curtail, mm -hmm. um, you know, coming into the horse industry. Okay. Any thoughts, Al? Uh, you know, uh, John, I, you've got more experience hands-on than I do. I, I would say just as an observer of this for many years, 26% is not, at the end of the day, it's not a horrible buyback rate. And I think the sale ended just right around 24.9 or 25 percent RNAs on the whole. You know, people are setting their um, their reserves realistically, um, and, and you know, and prize money is good. Um, people are maybe more willing to uh, you know to, to buy back a horse and, and, and take it to the track. So. Uh, um, you know, it's hard to say. It's always an interesting dynamic there. No question about it. And the only other thing that I would add to that, Al, and, and you're exactly right, is that um, you say, okay, well, is there another reason why the RNA numbers are, are, are different, um, you know, than, than in previous years? In, in, and I believe actually it was in, in, in uh, TDN where the withdrawal rate for the sale was actually higher by 5% than it's been in the past couple of years. So, again, people are willing to say, I'm going to bring my horse to auction, and if I'm not getting – the kind of action that I think I'm going to get, I'm going to scratch rather than RNA. So I think where the RNA numbers might even be artificially higher mm. if you include the, uh, you know, the number of withdrawals of horses that came onto the sales grounds and didn't actually go to the ring. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, oftentimes I find that the better or more interesting metric is to add the outs and the RNAs and see what that percentage is as a ratio to, to the number of horses cataloged. Um, I didn't look at it th this time. John's giving me a sheet of paper. You guys actually did it. That's where I got my numbers from. So I have to think you brought props. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it's actually, it, it increased from 15% to 19%, the, the amount of withdrawals. Mm -hmm. And if you add that to the 25% uh, that you're talking about, now it's just to keep the math easy, that, that's almost 40, you know, a little more than 40%, 44% mm -hmm. to be exact, of horses that were either scratched or, uh, or, or, or RNA'd. And so this is from our weekly sales ticker um, from the edition of the 24th. In 2015, the percentage of horses sold as a ratio to the number catalog was touching 66%. This year, that number was 61.4%. So um, I, I just, I, I've always thought that was an, an interesting way to do yeah, it. And, and kudos that. to you guys for actually putting those numbers together. That was really, it, it opened my eyes. We're going to shift gears now and start to look towards this weekend, big weekend of racing. Santa Anita and Belmont. And this is something that honestly could have led the show, but we're Santa Anita opens Friday and I saw that they released their veterinary team. They got seven veterinarians doing pretty, uh, pretty extensive work in, in green lighting horses to get on the track. Some people might be in favor of that. Some people might think it's a little too cumbersome either way. They are, they are trying to do a positive PR blitz, I think ahead of this meet, and, and rightfully so because I think it was the last night or the night before that Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, had a press conference and was asked about racing and basically said, either reform or die. Those were basically his. I give his, you the exact his, quotes. His, okay, there you go. He said, uh, dangerously close to being out of business 
Then he said, I'll tell you, talk about a sport whose time is up unless they reform. I mean, those are very, very strong comments Mm -hmm. um, from someone. I I, I don't know. Obviously, I don't think the governor can just sign some sort of executive order just saying horse racing is out of business. But nonetheless, the last guy in the state you want saying those sort of things is the governor. And uh, it it is... um, the meet at Santa Anita, you know, we're going to see all these graded stakes races this weekend. We're going to see the Breeders' Cup coming up. This meet, the only thing that matters is safety. Mm-hmm. That That's it. Um, and, you know, there's no reason to believe that we'll have a repeat of what we had in the spring because I think Santa Anita has done everything they po- humanly possible they could do. To, uh, to make sure that the racing is as safe as possible. But there's also the luck factor involved, too. Mm-hmm. And God forbid if, you know, the first week of racing, four or five horses break down, uh, you know, I can't even imagine what that's going to mean for Santa Anita and California racing and for uh, ra- horse racing in general. Or a single breakdown. I mean, yeah. Yeah, forget four or five. You know, yeah. one horse. That, that's down. true. Yeah, the yeah. public and the public, at least with Santa Anita, if not for racing and racing in general, I think has a zero tolerance mindset now when it comes to that. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the Breeders' Cup specifically. Uh, you know, I'm I'm going to be out there covering the Breeders' Cup. I hope this doesn't get my credential revoked. But I was I was pretty surprised when they decided to keep the Breeders' Cup there after they met about it. And I understand it's a big event. You know, with tens of thousands of people coming and it, it's it's hard to reroute that kind of thing you know however long it was four or five months in advance but to me the problem this is this is an optics problem you know this isn't this isn't you know about this safety measure or that safety measure or you know that's the public doesn't care about any of that the question is going to be and god forbid a horse breaks down during the breeders cup because you know until the derby that's the last time all eyes are going to be on racing. What is, and so people are going to ask, why did you run this event at this place where there were dead horses, where you were in the news for dead horses for months at a time? And I don't think the Breeders' Cup is going to have a good answer for that. And to me, there was no, you know, adequate explanation of why they were keeping the event there other than logistics. That's the only one that I can think of. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping for the best. We're all hoping for the best. This is not going to reflect well on our sport if something bad happens. But especially if you had a chance to move this away from this kind of spotlight and didn't, and then something happens, I mean, God help us, Joe, honestly. Joe could not disagree with you more. First of all, the other option was Churchill Downs, and the statistic came out in the Louisville Courier-Journal that Churchill Downs was the second most dangerous race. The public doesn't know that. The public knows about Santa Anita. Okay, but look, a horse could break down at Churchill Downs as well. And there's still maybe the firestorm would be slightly less than if it was at Santa Anita. But Santa Anita, more so than any other track, most tracks are still just sitting on their butts doing nothing. Absolutely nothing to solve this problem. Del Mar and Santa Anita are leading the way. They had a great meet at Del Mar. When this track bends over backwards and does everything possible to make racing safe, how can you take you they need to be rewarded for doing that. Now you're right, it's a it's a horrible it's a big PR risk, but it, it just it, I don't think you say to a racetrack, you got to go out and do everything you can, hire all these extra vets, um, check out the horses before the workouts, do this, do this, do this, do this. Oh, thank you for doing that. And oh, by the way, we're taking the Breeders' Cup away from you. I, I think it would have been completely unfair to Santa Anita. And, you know, they could they, they could hold the Breeders' Cup at the Muskegon Fair and six horses could break down there too. And, and it just, like, I understand what you're saying. The fury is going to be worse at San Anita than other places. And again, we get into this a lot on this podcast of what, you know, insiders like ourselves understand about the sport and what outsiders don't. And you're right. People are going to say that, that, you know, uh, this is the death racetrack. Why'd you let it run at this? But I think it would have been incredible 
incredibly unfair to San Anita after what they did to try their very, very best to uh, uh, make horse racing safer there. And and frankly, I'm I'm shocked that more racetracks have have not followed suit. We we really don't see anyone else, uh, with the possible exception of Del Mar, you know, really doing the things that San Anita is doing. And, and I think these damn tracks better to start doing it real quick because, you know, they're going to have a San Anita Lake problem on their hands too if, if they don't start doing more. Well, we mentioned this last week, and I, I, I agree with what you're saying, that it wouldn't technically be fair to Santa Anita, but the, the stuff that they're doing is reactive. And we talked about this last week, the difference versus action and reaction when it comes to these things. So, yeah, I commend Santa Anita and Del Mar for what they're doing. They're doing a great job by all me by all reports that they're doing the best that they can to make sure and minimize the level of breakdowns and injuries. So I'm not saying that they're doing anything wrong right now. I'm saying that this is a PR crisis, and I don't think it makes sense when you have the option to run it to run this event, this worldwide championship event at a track that go ask someone on the street if they've heard of Santa Anita and ask them what they've heard about it. And I don't think it makes sense if there are other options to, to keep running it there. And again, it's not because of, San, you know, Santa Anita, it could, could have just been bad luck, everything that happened at Santa Anita. I'm not even suggesting that they did anything wrong. But to say that they're like instating reforms after the track put the entire sport in the crosshairs because it couldn't stop dead horses from dropping left and right for six months. Like, I don't know that you re- that you necessarily have to reward that. You know what I mean? It's just the kind of thing. This is a PR crisis. This is an optics crisis. And I don't think that just because now they're doing the right thing safety wise, and they could have always been doing the right thing safety wise. Like I said, it, it could have just been bad luck, but I just don't think that's a good enough reason to run the, the, the event there that this, they're now doing all this stuff to, to increase safety. God bless them. And I'm happy that they're doing it. But this is an optics crisis. This isn't about minutia. No, I, I, I know exactly what you're saying, and I don't I necessarily disagree with that. But, you know, I'm going to stick to my guns. And it, it was, you know, shouldn't go unnoticed that the Breeders' Cup Board voted unanimously to keep it at Santa Anita. You, you know, I just I just don't think they should have been thrown under the bus. On this one, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. Yeah. No, and I'm not, this isn't, this isn't like a personal thing against Santa Anita. It's just, again, like I, I think this is about public the public impression at this point and i don't think like i said i don't think they're going to have a good answer for why they kept the, the event there if something bad happens and what happened at, at del mar i mean do, does anybody have a theory for why it was a clean meet is that was there something magic in the mist off the pacific ocean well, john you're the statistics expert aren't i mean you know just there aren't there just clust in statistics you know clusters of things happen that are out of the ordinary. I mean, remember what happened at Aqueduct uh, six, seven years ago that they had that problem there as well. Um, pro- you know, I'm not a racetrack expert. Um, you know, some of the criticism that, of them sealing the track in the beginning when they probably shouldn't have been racing is probably pretty valid. But uh, my guess is the, 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 the main contributing factor was bad luck and the main contributing factor at Del Mar, who has also had meets with, with very high breakdown rates, was good luck. What would a statistical person say about this? No, you're exactly right. I mean, everything's going to fall back to the uh, the back of the baseball card. So if, uh, if if a hitter is hitting 400 in the beginning of the year, but he's a 200 hitter, then eventually he's going to go 0 for 40, and, and the numbers will line up again. Um, you know, so just like, you know, if Santa Anita had at a – "Quote unquote bad statistical period, and Del Mar had an equally good statistical. The, the the norm is going to be the same. I think what a lot of people don't hear about in the business, though, they they see it. Joe, to your point, they see it on TV and they see a horse break down, and, and that's tragic. It is. Um, I'm not just saying it as as an owner, but just for the sport and and as a human being, you you feel you know that that empathy for you know for for the for the athlete. What a lot of people aren't seeing, though, also is that in the mornings horses break down." Um, you know, not just when, when they're competing in the afternoon. And, and that's the brutal part of the business is that it, it just happens, unfortunately. Um, but I think that, that Santa Anita is doing everything in their power to try to rectify that situation. And the fact that Del Mar had such a clean, quote unquote, clean period of time is helping California racing. Um, but it, I, I, you know, Joe, to go back to your point, it, it, it was a logistics situation. Mm-hmm. Um, if Keeneland was offered the, the, the Breeders' Cup a year earlier to swap 
it if, if logistically they could do it and they could get the hotel rooms and everything like that i think they would have done that mm -hmm. um and then they would have said okay santa anita we're rewarding you for doing all these things um to make the track safer and we're gonna have you be the premier for a year and we're gonna hype it up and everything like that here's the one thing that i really worry about no matter what santa anita does a horse will break down at the meet there's just it's completely unavoidable have we gotten to the point where the animal rights activists and maybe the american public at large and when that horse breaks down it's going to be on the front page of the sports section of the los angeles times it's probably going to be reported on every six o'clock news report in los angeles how close are we to the point where the american public PETA, uh, all, all these other groups are going to say one, nope, one too many. The only number that we accept is zero. And if that is going to become the mentality that is out there, ooh, I don't know what horse racing is going to do. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the problem is that it becomes a fundamental argument for a lot of people that horses shouldn't be used for this purpose, for entertainment, for money, for whatever. A lot of people don't believe in domestication of animals really uh, you know at, at to any point like a lot of the people PETA people don't believe in having dogs or cats or you know the problem is with Santa Anita to me is that they've already let the animal rights activists in the discussion they're already at these CHRB meetings and asking all these questions and making a stink and everything that happened during Santa Anita there was always we always had to print the reaction from PETA or whatever so they're already in the discussion so it's a good it's a good question that you raise Bill that and I think they've been kind of evasive on whether or not zero is the only acceptable number. So it's a good it's a good debate to be had. But the problem is, like, I, at the same time, I don't want to, you know, kowtow to them and do everything just to make the animal rights activists happy. But they're also now in the discussion. They're now part of racing's landscape, I guess I would say. Well, let's just hope it is as uh, zero is probably impossible, but let's hope for a miracle. Or if not zero, let's just hope for a, as small a number as possible. And then, you know, if if in fact Santa Anita can have the kind of meat that Del Mar had, it's every day the story is going to get a little bit quieter, a little bit quieter, and a little bit quieter. And that's what they need. I, I think Santa Anita benefited greatly from, from Del Mar, yeah. uh, where, you know, the news trucks just drove away. Well, nothing's happening here out mm -hmm. at this place. So, um, uh, you know, if, if they would have had a horrible meet at Del Mar, that would have just made things even worse for Santa yeah, There was a time where I, I used to be, like, really excited any time a racing story broke through into the mainstream. And now it's like, please don't talk about us <laughs> at all, ever. It, it could always be a drug story instead, you know. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, we saw last week yeah. what that can do to racing's image as well. But, yeah, we're all knock on wood here that uh, nothing goes wrong at the Santa Anita meet, especially at the Breeders' Cup. So we'll, ju we'll just quickly talk about next weekend's races. We are already touched on it a little bit with Code of Honor. The Jockey Club Gold Cup, I think, is the, the weekend headliner. Somehow there are only five horses in the Jockey Club Gold Cup, but it's an interesting little feel. He's got Tacitus, who I think has been knocking on the door of entering that top three-year-old conversation this year, but he just he doesn't have the grade one win. So at this point, he's kind of an afterthought. Code of Honor, preservationist. You know, could make a late run for older male here. He's uh, obviously the horse to beat in here, Vino Rosso, and then a horse named Olympic Village, who I've never heard of, but it's Ron Paolucci racing. So it's a, it's a Luch sense. horse, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and we also got the the Bell Dame. We have the Pilgrim at Belmont. We got the Vosberg, another six-horse field. Promises Fulfilled, Imperial Hint, Friends of Fire. So some star power there, but, but short group overall. And we got the grade ones for two-year-olds at Santa Anita. Uh, Code of Honor, I, I agree with Bill that that's the most inter interesting storyline this weekend is whether or not he can tackle elders. And it's an interesting race because there's no no real speed, so it's going to become a real rider's race. But, uh, Bill, anything you, that stood out to you coming up this Saturday and Sunday? Yeah, I'm really interested in the Bell Dame because uh, we've been talking so much about the three-year-old championship. How about Horse of the Year? Uh, right now, Bricks and Mortar is, is the leader in the clubhouse. He's undefeated on the year. And uh, if he wins a Breeders' Cup race, I assume he, he would be horse of the year. Now, it's interesting. Chad Brown has yet to decide whether he's going to go in the mile and a half race or the mile. The horse has never run beyond a mile and a quarter and has won at a mile. My guess is he'll wind up in the mile and a half race. But if, if uh, Bricks and Mortar were to lose in the Breeders' Cup and if Midnight Bisu can run the table, uh, isn't she horse of the year? 
Yeah, and it's interesting to have that discussion at this point that the horse of the year is between a turf horse, an and older Philly, turf horse, yeah. and a filly. I don't know if that's ever happened before, but yeah, I agree. Well, there's still Math Wizard, you know. He could, uh, <laughs> he could sneak <laughs> or the other Maiden 16 climber yeah, right. the back door. Uh, who was the horse that ran second in there? we got to go find that horse and claim it. <laughs> yeah, seriously. John, anything about this weekend stick out to you? Uh, the one thing that, that, that stood out to me, just um, not necessarily about the specific horses, but just the, the number of horses that are running in these win your in races. Um, so many of the win in your in, I mean, the, the win in your in concept is phenomenal. I know as an owner, that's something that we shoot for um, as we're mapping out, you know, the, uh, the horse's uh, career path for the year, uh, racing path for the year. But I was astonished to see that there was a five and a six horse field for the other two win in your ends mm-hmm. here on the East Coast. And we're so close to the Breeders' Cup now. Yeah. Um, th- you know, does that mean that these other horses that have won or earned enough points, they're kind of, you know, just glide into the Breeders' Cup races and, and, uh, and, and not take that extra race? Or, um, you know, or is it just things are thinning out um, because horses, the fillies are getting retired? Um, and, uh, or they're going, you know, just running at straight three-year-olds at this point to, to try to get that last three-year-old, uh, grade one. Um, I don't know what the answer is, uh, you know, to, to that, but I'm, I'm shocked as, as a, as a fan of the sport, I always like to see eight, 10, 12 horses in a field and to see a five or six horse. And I know I pick on Luch because, you know, cause he's always running a horse in all these big races and usually it's in our way. You know, that <laughs> horse is usually in our way. Um, but in this case, in this field, I actually, you know, think that it's a good idea to run yeah. a horse in there as the fifth horse, because you never know what's going to happen. I don't think he's going to win, but it, you know, you get second or third in a race like that mm-hmm. and that's big dollars. Yeah. Well, I'll open up a whole nother can of worms and I don't want to keep this podcast going for another 45 minutes, but we also have the subject of there's too much racing and not enough horses as the full crop goes down. And, you know, we don't see, uh, you know, I don't want to say the bell dame should go away or the jockey club go cup should go away, but there's just way too many of, of these preps. You get the same situation for the Kentucky Derby. There's just too many of these races and not enough good horses to fill them. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and, you know, and, and unless we get that full crop back up to 35,000, don't see how that's going to happen. Um, uh, I, I, I think you're going to be seeing a lot more of this, John. I think the, the Pennsylvania Derby has cannibalized the Jockey Club Gold Cup in a way Definitely, since, since it yeah. became a grade one specifically. Yeah, right. and, and, and that's a, you know, a, a case in point in, in the breeding side, just if I can go to that side of the industry as well. Um, I've been told time and time again by Kentucky Hard Boots that unless your horse wins a grade two, don't even bother sending the pedigree down here to be a stallion prospect. Mm. That's just not the way it's going to be done. Um, and, you know, th- you, can, you can stand a horse regionally that hasn't won a grade two. Um, but for the most part, you better win a grade one or a grade two. And, and I think that's why, you know, so many of these race tracks are trying to get these grade one uh, races, you know, on their on their venue, um, because otherwise the people just aren't interested in running there if they have pros- stallion prospects. Mm-hmm. And just to follow up on your point about the Breeders' Cup one year, and I remember when they first instated that, and I was like, this seems kind of redundant because every horse that wins these races is going to end up at the Breeders' Cup anyway. But it does seem to be like a motivating factor where if people are choosing between two similar races, they're going to pick the winning year end. But the big difference now is they pay your entry fee. No, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Before. yeah. Right. I just didn't. I wasn't sure like how much yeah. of a motivating factor that would be, but I guess it is. Yeah. Yeah, and then you also get you get your entry fee taken care of. You also get ten thousand dollars for expenses mm-hmm. um, for travel expenses, which, which is you know which is great when you're running in California. I mean, if it's if it's here in New York or if it's in Kentucky, um, you know, it's 500 bucks to, to fly to, to, to bluegrass. Um, but for $10,000, you know, to get to California, that just about covers, you know, all your expenses, plus maybe a little bit extra for drinks and, and you know, and extracurriculars. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I hope they don't make you itemize it. <laughs> Al, anything? Yeah, I mean... Uh, we also have the Oklahoma Derby this weekend. Uh, Nine thirty uh, on Sunday night. That'll be fun. Sunday? Yeah, I'm closing so for, for be prime great. time. Yeah. Oof. Um, we have fun with that. Okay. So, um, not that it's attracted, uh, you know, a terrific quality force, but a horse like Tax is going to end up in that race. And and like you said, in terms of cannibalizing the, the Gold Cup, there's a horse. Wasn't he also claimed as well? Fifty thousand. Fifty thousand. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the year of the claimer. Yeah. yeah. All right, that's it. That's it for this week's episode of the TDN Writers Room. I want to thank Bill Finley, Alan Carrasso, and returning champion John Green. We hope you can join us a couple more times, and uh, we'll see you next week. All right, 